The Feast of Tabernacles of 32 AD was the line drawn in the sand. The breach between Jesus and the Sanhedrin could not be healed. This conflict could only end one way, and that way was the path of death. Somebody is going to die. For the next six months, the ministry of Jesus centered mainly in the lands of Perea, east of the Jordan River. Christ's Perean ministry was cut in half for a brief period during the Feast of Dedication on December 18th of 32 AD. The Perean ministry was designed by Jesus to prepare his disciples for his death and resurrection, but also for their eventual responsibility in his church. The nation rejected Jesus. Therefore, Christ downplayed his public ministry during this time and worked privately with his disciples. In December of 32 AD, the Feast of Dedication arrived and Jesus and his disciples journeyed from Perea to Jerusalem to celebrate this feast. The Feast of Dedication was a joyous festival in commemoration of the restoration of the altar and purification of the temple by Judas Maccabeus six and one half years after its defilement by Antiochus Epiphanes. On December 15th of 168 BC, Antiochus IV ordered a pagan altar built on the great altar of burnt offering in Jerusalem. And on December 25th, he sacrificed swine's flesh to the Olympian Zeus. According to the book of 2 Maccabees, the Gentiles filled the temple with debauchery and revelry. They amused themselves with prostitutes and had intercourse with women, even in the sacred court. They also brought into the temple things that were forbidden, so that the altar was covered with abominable offerings prohibited by the law. The Maccabean revolt ended with the capture and rededication of the temple in 164 BC. The temple was polluted and desecrated, and only one unpolluted flagon of oil was found. This amount of oil was just sufficient to illuminate the temple for one day. But it was miraculously replenished for eight days. According to Jewish tradition, this is the reason the Feast of Dedication lasts for eight days. As Jesus entered Solomon's porch, he was accosted by some of the Jews, which stated, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus responded to the challenge of the Jews by stating that their problem was not in lack of information, but lack of willingness to believe his testimony. But ye believe me not, because you are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. The reason many of the Jews were not Christ's sheep was their refusal to submit to his pastoral teachings and ministry. The Jews perceived that Jesus' teachings would create a new order, and they were not willing to leave Judaism. Jesus then said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Jesus said that those who are submitted to his shepherd ministry hear his voice. He wanted his hearers to understand that his disciples would be taught by divine revelation, while the Sanhedrin would be consumed with ritualistic religion. Jesus promised his sheep that he would know them through intimate relationship, not through intellectual pursuit. Then he also said, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The new order offered by Jesus is sealed in the promise of the Holy Spirit established in the eternal life of Christ. Those who enter his sheepfold through faith in him are created new by his life, and they will not perish or rot under the judgment of the world. Jesus also said, My Father, which gave them to me, is greater than all, 
and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Jesus stressed that the Pharisees would never be able to destroy his church because it was built and established by God. No created existence, man or spirit, will ever pluck his church out of this earth. Jesus now really upsets the apple cart when he said that God the Father and him are one being. Christ's declaration so angered the Jews that they sought to kill him because he stated that he was God. This was a blatant act of blasphemy. In their minds, Christ was an imposter since he did not conform to their theology. Jesus questioned the Jews for which miracle they would stone him for, and the Jews responded. We are not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus then defended his claim with two pieces of evidence. Is it not written in your law? I have said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said, I am God's son. Do not believe me unless I do what my Father does. But if I do it, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Again they tried to seize him, but he escaped from their grasp. Jesus first rebuked the Jews for their ignorance of scriptural truth found in the Bible. According to scripture, man was made in the image of God, and this concept offended the Jews. The second defense of Jesus stated that the miracles confirmed his mission, word and person. Again the Jews sought to kill Jesus. Therefore he left Jerusalem and journeyed to Bethany in Perea. This was the last feast Jesus would attend before his crucifixion. The opposition of Judea reached such a degree that every time Jesus made a public appearance, the Jews sought to kill him. Because of this reaction, Jesus withdrew to Bethany in Perea. The second half of Christ's Perean ministry was a time of quiet interlude with his disciples. It was during this time Jesus sought to prepare his disciples for his death and resurrection. John chapter 10, verse 40 to 42. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. Here he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, Though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. The inhabitants of Perea received the ministry of Jesus because he fulfilled the prophetic word of John, and great miracles followed Jesus, confirming his word and work. Perea was hospitable to Christ's ministry. He was free to minister to his disciples without Pharisaic interference. During this quiet interlude, Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was very ill and near death. When Jesus heard this report, he said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Up to this point, Judea had not experienced the miracle of resurrection. Before Lazarus, Jesus performed the raising of the dead only in Galilee with the resurrection of the widow's son in Nan and Jairus' daughter. The resurrection of Lazarus was designed by God to bear witness to Jesus and his messianic ministry to Judea and Jerusalem, 
and to also strengthen the faith of his disciples. This notable miracle would be the last witness Judea and Jerusalem would receive prior to the sacrifice of Jesus. With this miracle, there could be no doubt that Jesus was the Messiah, and failure to recognize this miracle would seal the fate of Judea. The prospects of going back to Jerusalem frightened the disciples because they knew of the plot of the Jews to kill Jesus. According to the Pharisees' plan, the moment Jesus was under their dominion, they would secretly arrest him. According to the geography of Israel, the distance between Bethany of Perea and Bethany of Judea, the home of Lazarus, was approximately 30 miles. Since the average one-day walking distance of a man is 20 miles, the journey would be a long one day. According to information given in verse 17, Lazarus had been dead four days when Jesus arrived. With the time frame recorded, one day was required for the message to reach Christ. Jesus tarried in Perea for two days and one day travel for Jesus to reach Lazarus. According to these facts, Lazarus was dead when the message reached Jesus. When Jesus arrived in Bethany, the scene was filled with great sorrow and lamentation. And Martha ran to meet Jesus and said, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Martha's declaration was filled with hope in the humanity of Jesus. She realized that Jesus commanded authority over sickness, but in her mind, only God could give life to the dead. The problem with Mary's faith was her perception of Christ. She knew that God would respond to the prayer of Jesus, but she failed to realize that Jesus was God. The remaining discourse between Martha and Jesus reveals a lot about the perception the Jewish people had of Jesus. In response to Martha's declaration, Jesus said, Your brother will rise again. When Martha heard the response of Jesus, she began to recite a portion of her theology. I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. When Martha was confronted with the promise that God would raise Lazarus, she responded according to her theology, because she could not perceive the absolute deity of Christ. Jesus confronted the theology of Martha by saying, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? In response to Martha's theological statement concerning the resurrection, Jesus declared that the power of resurrection belonged to him, since in him dwelt the eternal life of God, and he could give this life to anyone. In simple terms, Jesus admonished Martha that he was the Son of God, and he held the power of resurrection. Martha responded by saying, Yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. After being confronted with Jesus' declaration that he was God, Martha proclaimed Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus was not seeking from Martha a doctrinal theological creed, but he wanted Martha to reach out in faith and touch the power and life of his deity. During the discourse of Lazarus' death, Jesus groaned within his spirit twice. It's obvious Christ wept because he did not find faith, he found religion. Jesus did not come to create a new religion. He came to create a new faith, a relationship with God. In the midst of the cloud of unbelief, Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus and instructed Martha to order the stone rolled away. But she hesitated in unbelief. Jesus admonished Martha 
to reach out with the eye of faith and not with the mind of theology. Finally, Martha grasped a glimmer of faith and obeyed the command of the Lord to have the stone rolled away. The glory of the Lord was released and Lazarus rose from the dead. The Bible records two different reactions by the Jews who witnessed this miracle. The first reaction was that many of the Jews that saw the glory of God in Christ believed in Him as the Messiah. The second reaction was a few observers ran to the Pharisees and told them of the miracle of Lazarus. For all intent and purpose, the Pharisees were glad Lazarus was dead because of his close relationship to Jesus. Now he was alive and Jesus' authority was confirmed. Because of the miracle of Lazarus, the Sanhedrin gathered to determine what they would do with Jesus. Because of Christ, the Pharisees and the Sadducees put aside their doctrinal differences to plot the murder of Jesus. According to prevailing Pharisee doctrine, the Messiah would come as a political king and establish a political kingdom in opposition to Rome. The Sanhedrin feared the nation would accept Christ as Messiah because of his miracles. Jesus as Messiah would establish his kingdom in opposition to Rome, and Rome would destroy the nation. Should this incident occur, the Sanhedrin would lose their political control. The incident the Jews feared the most, the destruction of Jerusalem by Rome, did occur in AD 70 because they rejected Jesus. During the council debate, Caiaphas the high priest stood up and ended the debate. Caiaphas stated that their argument was not necessary. Since the obvious solution would be to kill Christ, then let the people perish at the hand of the Romans. Caiaphas did not realize that his evil words were part of God's plan. John chapter 11, verse 51 through 52. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. God honored the office of the high priest, not the man. Therefore Caiaphas prophesied in a similar way as the prophet Balaam. During this secret gathering of the Sanhedrin, they also counseled to kill Lazarus because he was a living testimony to the messianic ministry of Jesus and many people believed in Jesus because of Lazarus. Because of the ministry of Jesus, the Sanhedrin united to kill Christ. After the council of the Sanhedrin, Jesus withdrew from Judea and resided in Ephraim with his disciples until the time of his sacrifice drew near. Just before the Passover of 33 AD, in which Christ would be sacrificed, he began a brief tour of Samaria and Galilee. It would appear Christ traveled on the borders of Samaria and Galilee because Judea and Galilee had rejected him. When Jesus completed his brief tour of the border regions of Samaria and Galilee, he journeyed down the eastern side of the Jordan River through Decapolis and Perea. He crossed the Jordan River and stopped at Jericho, approximately 15 miles from Jerusalem, and encountered Zacchaeus, the chief publican, in a sycamore tree. We can speculate as to why Jesus returned to Jerusalem using this route. According to Mark, several women came with Jesus to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. It's obvious these women did not follow Jesus during his winter ministry. Therefore, Jesus journeyed along the borders of Samaria and Galilee to pick up those who would come with him to Jerusalem and minister to him during his final days. When we compare the resurrection of Lazarus 
with the reaction of the Jews and the Sanhedrin. Each of these events has one thing in common. They are all actions of faith. Should this be true, then what is faith? Faith has two levels. The first level of faith believes that faith is a religion, an institution of belief in a divine power. Many institutions view faith and religion as the same. Secular humanism believes that the Buddhist faith is the same as the Christian religion. In the eyes of many theologians, the Christian faith is the doctrinal agreement we all maintain in Jesus. Martha, the sister of Lazarus, approached Jesus with theological agreement with the doctrines taught by Jesus. But initially she did not touch Jesus with the spark of true spiritual faith. Her reaction, even though it was different, came from the root of doctrinal agreement. While the Pharisees and the Sadducees also view Jesus through their theological glasses. Even though their points of view may have been different, the religious root is still the same. There is another faith that transcends theological agreement, that rises above religious debate and touches the heart of Jesus. Jesus sought for this faith in Martha, but found doctrinal agreement. He sought for this faith in the nation of Israel and the Sanhedrin, but found theological debate. True spiritual faith can only be found in personal relationship with God. Jesus nurtured his faith during seasons of intimate prayer and fellowship with his Father. His disciples also nurtured this type of faith in prayer and stillness of heart. This simple requirement of faith has not changed throughout church history. We all must nurture our faith in quiet interludes with Jesus. The Jesus we know through intimate relationship will be the Jesus we trust during seasons of trial. We have two faiths to consider. Which faith do we offer Jesus through our Christian experience?